It's a challenge, of course, shared with the UAE. How do you work with the desert for food security? So we'll address that key question on a global scale in today's keynote lecture. Joining us, Professor Daniel Hamovitz, president of Ben Gurion University in the Negev, right in the heart of Israel's desert. Before taking on that role, he founded Tel Aviv University's program on food security. And uh, his book, What a Plant Knows, has been translated into 19 languages. I'll spare you all the other details because there are many of his biography. But Professor Daniel Hamovitz, please, on food security from the desert. Thanks very much for the kind uh, introduction. It's wonderful to be here among friends, um, both here um, and around the world. Hi. Um, after that introduction, actually, you know, I'm not really sure there's much more I can say because that, that video basically did it all. And I'm a little humbled giving this lecture in front of people who could give this same lecture or who actually taught me some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today. But the story I'm going to talk about this morning is both an international, a national, and also a deeply personal story for me. Because um, this is me with a lot more hair, 1981, 1982, at Kibbutz Keturah, in the south of Israel's Negev Desert in the Arava. And you see me here driving a tractor. This was a tractor I drove in the alfalfa fields in the middle of the desert. And it was more or less on this day that this picture was taken that I had a eureka moment that may be the reason that I'm standing here today. Because until that moment, like many American Jewish children whose parents or father was a physician, and my three uncles were physicians, and my sisters were physician, and cousins were physicians, I was sure I was going to be a doctor. But on that day in the desert, as I'm driving the tractor, which gives you a lot of time to think, I noticed that when you cut alfalfa, it's going, this is going to be funny for some of the people in the room, it grows back. I didn't know anything about plants. But when you cut wheat, it didn't. And I had this idea that, wait a second, if we can understand why alfalfa grows in the desert, but wheat, when you cut it, doesn't, maybe we could feed the world. And on that day, I decided to study plant genetics rather than to be a physician. Now, my career took me through basic plant science, but back towards food security later in my career. And I want to just set the table and define what we mean by food security. And it's already almost a 30-year-old definition from the World Food Summit. Food security exists when all people at all times have the physical and economic access to sufficient safe and nutritious food that meets the dietary needs, but not only calories, but also cultural preferences for an active and healthy life. And now when we talk about food security, we may think we're talking about a modern issue, but we need to realize that food security has affected all of human history and as our history as Jews in particular, because it's both an ancient and a modern program problem. Why did Abraham, father of the Jews, and the Muslims, the Arabs. Why did Abraham leave the land of Israel and go down to Egypt? Because there was a famine in the land. You know, 3,000 years ago, we already had a problem with food security causing population movements. And we see this also today. Why are hundreds of thousands of people walking from Syria through Turkey into Europe? because of food security. Famine, water, looking for enough food for their children. So the problem we're talking about has always been influencing human development because a food secure people is a people that stays where it is. So what are the challenges today for food security? One, of course, population growth. Over the past 50 years alone, we've had a doubling of the human population. Since I was born, it's been tripled. And by the middle of the century, we're gonna have over 9 billion people on the world, in the world. And of course, the majority of this population growth is in developing countries. Add to this that we have an expanding middle class. This is wonderful from, uh, from standards of living, but an expanding middle class also has higher caloric needs. So we need more food. 
But challenge number three is, is as we have more people, there's less land to grow the pe less land to grow food, less land available for agriculture. Urbanization. This is the town where I live, Hodesharon. All of these houses used to be fields. So you have the double whammy: more population, less land. How are we going to be able to feed the people? Now the good news is, today in the world, there is proportionally less hunger than at any time in human history. And the reason it is is that even though we have less land available for agriculture, over the past hundred years, every year there's been an increase in yields. But these yield gains are leveling out. There seems to be maybe a plateau that we're reaching in yields of corn and wheat and rice, that modern technology has leveled off. And if we don't manage to increase these yields again, we're gonna find ourselves in big trouble. You know, arable land is decreasing by over 100 square kilometers a year. So while 24% of the Earth's surface is arable, just in another 30 years, it might be down to about 20%. So this is, this is a problem. We're going to need to increase uh, yields by maybe up to 30% in the next few decades, just to maintain caloric levels that we have today. And of course, we're going to have to do this in a rapidly changing environment. And we'll be hearing a lot more about this later. We have to increase yields, how to do it with less water, less phosphates, less land. So this is an uncertain future for food production. And because of this, I was involved in a major project um, recently that was funded by the Association of Academies and Societies of Sciences in Asia, the AASSA, which was trying to understand food security in Asia in the coming decades. And the challenge is how to ensure food security over the next 20 or 30 years. Now, I won't go through this entire report, it's available online, um, but there are a couple implications from this report. First, the world will need to produce 70% more food by 2050. But it's not just more food, sometimes we get stuck on calories, we need healthier food. Because if we look at food security, while in the developing world, we look at it as a caloric problem, in the developed world, we're suffering from too many calories. It's also a food security problem. We're gonna to have to do this with less arable land, less water, and fewer phosphates. And just to quote the end of this report, because this all sounds rather, rather um, pessimistic, but I'm here because I'm an optimist. Science offers solutions, but plans need to be made now. And this is very important for the politicians listening, for the politicians around. Plans need to be made now and enacted boldly and decisively if catastrophe and great suffering are to be avoided. Now I wanna go back to this one. We have less arable land, less water, fewer phosphates. 40% of the Earth's surface is dry lands and desert. And in our region of the world, up to 90% of the lands, okay? But this is an incredible resource if we can learn to utilize it for agriculture. And to do this, I have to go back to Israel's first entrepreneur. We talk about Israel's being startup nation. So who was Israel's first entrepreneur? David Ben-Gurion, because David Ben-Gurion could see things that other people didn't and act on them. Back in 1958, and I have to read this quote of David Ben-Gurion, this was at the founding of the Negev Research Institute, which then became Ben-Gurion University. Only the scholars and scientists who will, sit in the gates, who will sit at the gates of the Negev desert through daily observation and continuous research will be able to expose its treasures. They will study the blessings of the sky and sun, which shower endless treasures of energy and dew, which go to waste because we do not know how to utilize them to make the desert blossom, as we still do not know how to utilize salt water, arid soil, and the seemingly sparse vegetation. 1958, before anyone was talking about climate change, David Ben-Gurion 
saw our local problem as a global problem. Amazing quote. And so our desert, the Negev, Ben Gurion University, we're, we're realizing his dream here in the Negev because he understood the power and potential of academia to transform a region. 60% of Israel, only 9% of its population. But we have a problem in academia. Or we have a problem in policy. Yes, we can provide answers, but it's expensive and there's a lag. If you look at all, what this graph is showing you is that between research and implementation, there can be a decades long lag. The return is infinitely more than the investment, but you have to be able to see the long distance. You could have a five, 10 year investment that only 20 and 30 years later, you see the return on, which though is still much more than was invested. So how do we get through this research lag? We can see this all the time. This is just uh, innovations in corn breeding in the United States. It took over 20 years for hybrid maize to be adopted. It took over 30 years for modern irrigation and for modern uh, fertilization to be adopted. Interestingly, GM corn was adopted only within 10 years, but still we have this research lag and we have to find the way of going it through. And this is where government investment is key. And so we can look at how do governments invest in research and development. At this top graph, this was Israel over the past um, 20 years. And we saw at the end of the 20th century, Israel had a massive increase in the amount of R&D spending as a percent of GDP. This was great. But unfortunately, over the past decade, it's leveled off. But if we look at other countries, South Korea keeps going up and up, and we've seen the advances South Korea makes. China increasing every year, and we see the advances China has made. But if we look at India and other countries, the investments are not there. So first of all, this has to come from governments if we want to ensure food security in the future. So the answer, I think, is a very simple equation. Dry lands plus science plus technology is food security. This is obviously, this is the only area of the world where we'll be able to increase agricultural production. So, but what are our constraints then for desert farming? And it's obvious. First of all, insufficient rain. We don't have enough water. Because we don't have enough water, also what the water there is, there's a high evaporative demand because of the heat, the water evaporates. And if there's any water there, it's saline, very brackish water. The sands, the soils, they're not particularly fertile. We have extreme weather conditions. We need to remember deserts aren't only heat. Deserts are also cold. And we have massive knowledge gaps. And this is where academia is so, so important. And a lot of people would say, you know, it doesn't make any sense to do agriculture in the desert. But as David Ben-Goyen, I have to come back to him because he really is our prophet here. If an expert says it can't be done, get another expert. And we have a lot of experts here in the audience. So at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev, actually all in Israel, I, I'll use Ben-Gurion as an example, but all the people in this room are doing what we're talking about. We're increasing dry land agricultural productivity and all of the crops we see here are now grown in the desert. What seems impossible is indeed possible. I'll just give you a few, ex a few examples of things that are not really even considered in desert agriculture. One that I'm particularly fond of because I have a very, um, uh, I like uh, wine. We now can grow wine in the desert Negev Highlands. Grow wine, we can produce wine because of vineyards that have been studied and developed to develop a very incredibly rich strain of grape which normally you would think that grapes are harmed by the high radiation. We now have grapes that thrive in this radiation, give a huge number of tannins, very unique tannins, a very 
interesting bouquet and taste to the red wine. And it's now being recognized internationally as a region. So there will be, you know, a Bordeaux wine, and now there's Napa Valley wine, and very soon the Negev Highlands are a rec recognized region for wine. And we could do this by reducing soil evaporation using drip irrigation in vineyards. I know the, the purists in France would go against this, but this wine will compete with any wine worldwide. Or another um, um, example, grafting melons on pumpkins. Now, why would you want to graft melons on pumpkins? Well, because melons have a great market, but they're incredibly sensitive to cold. And when we want to grow them in the desert is in the winter for export to Europe. But pumpkin is resistant to cold, the rootstock. So here we have in October, our grafting starting of melons on pumpkins, November, go through the end of November, they're flowering. In December, you already have fruits forming. And by the end of January, harvesting, just because of grafting of the melon on the pumpkin stalk. You know, we could also just very simply, and people will be talking about water usage later, um, rainwater harvesting. There is actually a lot of water in the desert. It's just not from rain. It's from rains in other areas of Israel, flooding the desert. But we can catch the runoff irrigate these olive trees, and that's enough water to get the harvest without having any irrigation whatsoever. You know, developing new crops adapted to various environmental stresses, all of these crops which are not thought of as desert crops are now grown in the desert. So what's the connection here to food security? These aren't necessarily things that are, this is, of course, it's calories. But these are foods that are now high value crops, which can then be traded with other countries in order then to have the imports of the grains and of the proteins. Upwards of 70% of Israel's, 70% of Israel's horticulture exports now come from the desert. But not only crops, we have other harvests in the desert, microalgae thrive under high irritated pressure, high temperatures. So you have high, you can grow algae for high value beneficial carotenoids and xanthophils, or for high value omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids using algae as a new agricultural product. So what have we learned, both at Ben Gurion University, at the Volcani Institute, in Israel in general, from 50 years of studying in the gates of the Negev? as Ben-Gurion said. First, there are no simple answers. You know, if it was so simple, everyone would be doing it. And real breakthroughs need multidisciplinary chutzpah. I think one of the things that we can export here to Dubai, to United Arab Emirates, to Morocco, to other countries in the world, is the chutzpah. To do agriculture in the desert, it takes chutzpah. It takes nerve to believe that it's possible. But if you believe it's possible, you can make that new reality. And what we once considered as local problems, how to live in our desert, how to live in our Negev, it's now a global problem. And that's why we're here at Expo 2020. That's why the world is coming to us to learn from our experience. And partnerships are essential. Partnerships between the academia, with governments, and with industry. Without that, very little can get done. And I want to give an, a new example. I want to introduce to you a new institute that we have, which is called the Miroshvili Institute for Food Security in the Desert. It's a new institute in our School of Sustainability and Climate Change. This institute is a collaboration First of all, between two existing institutes, the Zuckerberg Institute for Water Research at our Ben Gurion campus, at, Stabo, at, the ben, uh, at our Stable Care campus, the Blaustein Institutes for Desert Research in the heart of the Negev Highlands, and the French Institute of Agriculture and Biotechnology of Drylands. Where does this, the Miroshvili Institute come in? Here at this juxtaposition of the two. Merging, juxtaposing water and desert agriculture in collaboration with two new Israeli companies, Watergen, 
which is an Israeli company literally producing water from the air, or as David Ben-Gurion said, the dew that is getting wasted. And another company called Vertical Field, which is taking water from the air from water gin and doing vertical agriculture, very precision. They're, they're here. Ronan is here. There you go. So I gave a great introduction. And so what we are doing is in research in how to really perfect these techniques so that vertical agriculture from water from the air can be done anywhere in the world. And as I said, this is all part of our new initiative called the School of Sustainability and Climate Change, which is taking our 50 years of experience of living in the desert and making it accessible for the world. What we have is a super disciplinary group of over 150 outstanding scientists. I say they're outstanding, of course they are. Some of them are here. And the trick here for those in universities is how to get people from different disciplines to work together. Because everyone will tell you, yes, sustainability and climate change are important. And then everyone will tell you, oh, I'm sustainability and climate change. If I'm an ecologist, that's sustainability and climate change. If I'm a hydrologist, oh, that's sustainability and climate change. If I'm a geologist, that's sustainability. Actually, in our School of Public Health, they say, no, sorry, we are climate change because we need to understand how human health is affected by rising temperatures. And I can tell you now at Ben Gurion University, our Department of Hebrew Literature is saying that they are sustainability and climate change. What's the connection? Cli-fi, climate fiction. If you think of all of both in, you know, uh, fiction and nonfiction, what is the role of literature in changing people's perception of climate change? It actually may be much larger than this lecture. So this school is the magic dust, which is now influencing everything we do within the university. So it's a center of transdisciplinary academic teaching and research on the critical issues of climate change and sustainability, and understanding that it's not just a physical problem, but rather one raising a host of societal issues. And so what is the school doing? It's really trying to find real solutions to real world problems. There you have some algae being grown in the desert, solar energy, health, education, water, even air conditioning. Why are we doing this? We need to remember, we're not only doing this to feed ourselves, but there's a great quote that I just have to finish with, that hunger, it's not an issue of charity. It's an issue of justice. In Hebrew, it makes sense. It's not charity, it's tzedakah, it's justice. No mother or no father should have to go to sleep worrying where their child is going to get their next meal. Thank you very much. Do we have time? All right, well, well, yeah, it was, it's hard not to follow up a speech like that with a couple of questions. Uh, so let's open it up uh, if anybody has a couple here. And I'll just start maybe with a brief one to build on what you were talking about. You talked about how obviously there are big knowledge graphs. There's a, a need for uh, more research, for more investment, and you emphasize the need for collaboration. And that's such a big part of what we're all doing here to try to create new collaboration to solve those problems you talked about. Are there any more specifics you might be able to give on what kind of areas, uh, you know, what kind of collaboration, especially from your perspective uh, as president of Ben Gurion sure, University. Well, actually, I'm going from here on tomorrow to meet, first of all, with the, with the Emirati Minister of Education, and then from there on Wednesday to the United Arab Emirates University in Al Ain, which is the largest university and also their agriculture university, to, to sign on an MOU between collaboration between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, specifically on the field of water and food security. Because the challenges, while they're the same, each country brings its own flavor into it. And if we're not sitting around yeah. the same table, we don't understand both the challenges and expertise on how we can work together. So, for example, one of the things I know that, that the university is very interested in here is sending some postdocs and graduate students to our campuses to learn from the Israeli way of doing things. It's not that they're missing the science. Their science is at an incredibly high level here. What they're missing is the chutzpah. They literally the want export. to learn about our, the way we do innovation, the way we do entrepreneurship, and the way we think outside the box. 
If we could find a way of exporting that, actually, if we could find a way of selling that, we'd have no economic <laughs> problems whatsoever. That's great. Any, any other questions uh, before we wrap here? Go ahead. Yeah. The microphone is coming your way. Uh, very, very nice talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I noticed you, you mentioned two challenges in your talk. One of them, the reduced net gain in yield. Another is lower uh, land availability. While this is true for developed country, I believe in developing country, there is still very, very high potential in gaining yield and, and improving productivity. Similarly, in Africa, there is 70% of the agricultural land that has, been, has not been used. For instance, in Morocco, the average yield of, of wheat is only two tons per hectare. And one of the challenges we have is mostly has to do with the technology transfer, which you highlighted very, very, very well and the time it takes to, to transfer the technology. My question is how Israel can help in addressing some of the ch these challenges in, in developing countries. I, I wish I had asked you to ask that question first. Are you from Morocco? Uh, yes. So we also have a wonderful collaboration with uh, University Mohammed the Sixth Polytechnic, um, uh, completely around these issues. And you're right that in specifically in Africa, yield gains have not reached their potential. They've actually they've leveled off because of a technological problem and an uh, adoption problem, and not as an agronomic problem. Um, I, the challenge in Africa, I think, is several fold, as you mentioned. I think one of them is going to be that Africa, as they make this jump, needs to do the agriculture much more sustainably than it has been done in the United States or China. So as modernizing, not you know spray and pray, but using precision agriculture from the beginning. And here, Israel, many of the people in this room have a massive uh, responsibility for being involved in this so that we don't take advantage of the natural resources, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, and make sure that things are done as sustainably as possible. And again, it first comes from governments and universities working together, and from there, the trickle down. Great. We'll wrap up for now with that, but we're going to have a coffee.